In my 30 plus years in this field, I've seen my fair share of confusion and misinterpretation of requirements. Truth be told, I've been involved in a fair share of it. A lot of the confusion and misunderstanding boils down to how those requirements are expressed. Let's dive into how to best avoid these pesky problems. You've probably heard the old adage, less is more. And in the case of crafting effective requirements, this could not be more accurate. By focusing on simple, complete, and well-structured sentences, you can avoid a myriad of issues down the line. When requirements are clear and concise, they become easier to understand, implement, and verify, making your life as the one responsible for defining those requirements much more enjoyable. As a bonus, they also make it easier on those who implement your requirements. That's a true win-win. So let's start by addressing compound sentences, which I lovingly refer to as the troublemakers of requirements writing. These seemingly innocent sentences pack more than one thought. That makes them confusing and difficult to decipher. When you're writing requirements, remember to keep those thoughts separate. As if you're organizing a sock drawer. One thought per sentence, please. I know what you're thinking. What about the and word? Can't we use it to create a list? Absolutely. And is like the Swiss Army knife of words. It's versatile, handy, and absolutely critical for efficient communication. However, use it with caution. When you're creating a list, and is your friend. But if you use it to link two thoughts or actions together, it's a recipe for disaster. Let's discuss those pesky escape clauses also that we love to dread. I'm sure you're familiar with the usual suspects, when possible, if necessary, as required. And don't forget the qualifiers, unless, except the big if. They help you qualify and make you sound smart, but don't be fooled. These crafty phrases are notorious for muddling your requirements, making them clear as mud and as verifiable as a unicorn sighting. Join forces and let's get rid of these escape clauses, okay? We've covered the importance of simplicity in our sentence. Let's discuss this elusive complete sentence, a true gem in the realm of business analysis. Now, what makes the requirement complete? Picture it as a perfectly wrapped gift with everything neatly tucked inside, ready for the recipient to open up, to understand, and immediately appreciate. As you learned in that exciting English grammar class you took in high school, a complete sentence contains two essential ingredients, a subject and a verb. The subject is our actor, can be a person, a department, or an application. That takes center stage. The verb is the action that the actor performs. It paints a vivid picture of what's happening or what's expected. Obviously, appropriate modifiers provide additional information and context to help clarify the requirement. But there's more. A complete sentence in the world of requirements also conveys a single clear thought. It's like a laser-focused beam of information that leaves no room for ambiguity or confusion. So next time you craft a requirement, think of it as a complete sentence. Think of it as a gift to your stakeholders, elegantly wrapped in simplicity and clarity, ensuring a shared understanding and a successful project outcome. I can sense some of you itching to debate the use of will, shall, must, should, and may. This is the great debate in requirements engineering. When I don my developer hat, I can't help but agree with those who have a desire for precision. I mean, let's face it, developers need clarity to build solutions that truly meet the needs of the business. When a developer gets a functional requirement, they need to know what the function must do. Computers are notoriously bad at what they should or could do. In many organizations, the use of the word shall is preferred for requirements at this level. However, switching gears and putting on my trusty requirements solicitor hat, things look quite different. It is more important for the one capturing the requirement to listen carefully to the stakeholder expressing the business need. I recommend capturing their use of the words should, must, shall, will, etc. Since their language expresses the importance of the requirement from the business perspective, by embracing the full range of verbs when eliciting the requirements and adjusting the verbs according to industry and corporate standards during requirements analysis and prioritization, you actually achieve a balance between flexibility and precision. This ensures that your requirements are simple, what focused, and well-structured. 
you're off to a great start. So to wrap things up, take a moment to appreciate the power of simple sentences in crafting effective and clear requirements. By focusing on simplicity, by avoiding compound sentences and eliminating escape clauses, you're ensuring the proper structure. That sets the stage for successful projects and satisfied stakeholders. So, as you embark on your next business analysis endeavor, remember, embrace the power of simple sentences, well-structured requirement statements, and watch as the magic unfolds. In this video, I'm going to demonstrate how ChatGPT helps me evaluate a set of requirement fragments that are collected during the interviews with stakeholders. To start with, I clearly define the role I want the AI to play. In this case, a tech-savvy business analyst. That's kind of the way I look at myself. Next, I summarize the philosophy that I presented in the previous lecture, which emphasizes writing user requirements as simple, complete sentences, avoiding compound sentences, using the and word carefully, and avoiding escape clauses or commas. I also reiterate the two essential ingredients of a complete sentence, meaning an actor and an action. After setting the stage, I asked ChatGPT4 to evaluate the requirements based on this philosophy. Once I've entered the requirements, ChatGPT4 analyzes each and offers its assessment. Interestingly, ChatGPT4 recognizes the first requirement as a compound sentence and suggests fighting it. It also correctly interprets how the word and is used in one case to form a compound sentence and in another case to create a simple list. Oh, that's pretty promising. It recognizes that number two is missing a subject and adds the system will. It even expands my abbreviations correctly. Call is short for collision coverage, while COM stands for comprehensive coverage. That shows that it speaks insurance lingo. ChatGPT4 does not recognize that calculating these three different types of coverage are distinctly different functions. So that's something that I, as the VA, will have to address later on. Statement three, just needs adjustment to change should to will. Now, interestingly, this is not one of my rules, but obviously ChatGPT4 has been trained on guidelines or software requirements by other folks. There are a lot of BAs that recommend this format. I assume I could override this if I wanted to. I'm not Captain Obvious, but you do have the power to define any rule you want ChatGPT to follow in the prompt for evaluating whether you have good requirement statements. However, it may or may not agree with you, which gives rise to some very interesting considerations or conversations with your AI. Now, ChatGPT4 also recommends changing internet best practices in statement four to established web accessibility and usability guidelines. I am going to need to do some research on this interpretation before I make any changes there. It approves of requirement five, so no change there. Hooray! Although I agree with its assessment of statement six, no pending claims, I don't agree with its suggested fix. Our app deals specifically with policy maintenance. The stakeholder's intent behind this fragment was the system will not allow modifications to existing policies or submission of new coverage for customers with pending claims. I'm going to change that also for the next route. I think ChatGPT4 does a great job of splitting requirement seven into three separate business functions. Well, and it approves of my requirement eight, but again, objects to the word uh, should in requirement nine. All in all, this use of the tool has, I think, a lot of potential. It makes me think about what my requirements express while also giving me confidence in those requirements that follow my philosophy. However, it is important to note that you, as the business analysts or requirements engineer, still have a major role to play in evaluating, reviewing, and refining the requirements before you could hand them off to the IT team. This is just the first step in improving the quality of user requirements. In later lectures, I'm going to demonstrate how to further refine these requirements and ensure a shared understanding and project success.